The Origin of Life. Notice I've subtitled this talk, Evidence for Creation. What we're going to see in this talk is scientific evidence that demands there be a creator God. Now, our roadmap through here will be this, the issue. We need to discuss, is there an issue between creation and evolution for how life originated? Then we're going to talk about attempts to create life. How well have scientists done in attempting to create life in a laboratory? Then we're going to look at the primordial soup where we're all supposed to have had our beginnings. Then we're going to take a more detailed look at the second law of thermodynamics and how it applies to origin of life. Then we'll finish it up with something called information and complexity. So what we're going to do in this one hour here, just one hour, we're going to talk about biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. So let's start here, the issue. The model of evolution teaches this, that about four and a half billion years ago, this earth evolved into existence all by natural processes, and God had nothing to do with it. Then over long periods of time, chemicals formed and created this thing we call the primordial soup. Then over more long periods of time, these chemicals bonded together to make molecules. And finally, over more long periods of time, these molecules bonded together to make the first living cell. And we have our formula, time plus chance equals life. Now, the creation model is quite a bit different. Probably one of the best verses in the Bible that talks about creation really comes out of the New Testament. We think... Genesis or creation is just an Old Testament idea, but no, one of the best verses really comes out of the New Testament. Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. Notice the use of the word all there. When you go to the Greek text, you know what that word all means? All. And notice the phrase visible and invisible. That covers everything. Even things like gravity that we can't see. We can only experience the effects, but we can't see it. God clearly stated he created all things. So we have an issue. One model says time and chance, natural processes. The other model says, no, God created all things. Now, before we get into all this, I need to do a little review of some terminology here. Some, term, some biological terms. And the reason I do this review is because sometimes we have people come to these lectures that have been out of the biology classroom for maybe a year or two. So let's start with our first term, the atom. Now what is our atom? Well, it's our basic unit of matter. Now what do atoms like to do? Well, sometimes atoms will bond together to make molecules. And one of the molecules we're familiar with is water, H2O. Now what do molecules like to do? Well, sometimes they will bond together to make Amino acids. Now these are very important in this talk because amino acids are referred to as the building blocks of life. If you can't get amino acids, you can't get life. And then finally, sometimes amino acids will bond together to make proteins. So atoms can make molecules, molecules can make amino acids, and amino acids can make proteins. See how easy biology is now? Well, there's actually a little more to it than that. Well, let's go on here. One more slide before we get into all the science. Call this history of evolutionary thought. Something called spontaneous generation. That is the idea that non-life can spontaneously generate new life. It was actually believed at one time that if you left meat out there, left it out there long enough, it would spontaneously generate new life. Well, the whole idea of spontaneous generation was finally proven scientifically false all the way back in the 1860s by Louis Pasteur. Now, if spontaneous generation is not scientifically true, then how does life originate based on the evolution model? What are they left with? Well, here's the new idea. They have changed the name spontaneous generation to chemical evolution. Well, what's the difference? Well, spontaneous generation, spontaneous generation is the idea that non-life produce life. What is chemical evolution then? It is the idea that non-life produce life. What's the difference? Or is there a difference? Well, maybe a small difference. Because when we talk about chemical evolution, we're talking all the way down there at the basic tiny chemical level. So what we want to do in the remainder of this talk is examine scientifically, is it possible for chemicals to bond together to make a living cell. Because if that is not possible, then there's only one alternative, 
And that is, in the beginning, God created. So let's start here with this picture. This picture is in just about every biology textbook in this country. It's called the Miller Experiment. In the early 1950s, Miller set out to create the building blocks of life in a laboratory. Now, notice I didn't say life. His objective was not to create life, but to create the building blocks of life, amino acids. So he built this spark chamber in his laboratory, and in there he tried to simulate the Earth's atmosphere of billions of years ago. So he put such gases as methane and ammonia in there and left oxygen out. Then he generated electrical sparks in there to drive the chemical reactions, and then it goes on to say he got amino acids, and he did get amino acids. Now let me show you a quote from one of our biology textbooks about the Miller experiment. And it says this, as the gases circulated in the chamber, sparks representing lightning supplied energy to drive chemical reactions. The experiment generated organic compounds including amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, or you might add the building blocks of life. Now, what is this stating here? This is stating that Miller was successful. Now, what has been the outcome of all of this? Well, the outcome has been devastating because here's what it's teaching our youth. Why do we need a creator God when we can do it ourselves? Well, what I want to do here is a little idea called critical thinking. I want to go back and examine this Miller experiment. I want to look at three th aspects of this Miller experiment. So, number one, how did Miller know what gases were in the atmosphere billions of years ago? Was he there? Number two, how much of the experiment was left to chance and how much was done using intelligent design? Because the model of evolution does not allow for intelligent design. And number three, were the amino acids that Miller got the right kind of amino acids for life or were they something else? So let's analyze all three of these aspects about the Miller experiment. And we'll start here, the atmosphere. The claim by the evolutionist community is that the early Earth's atmosphere did not contain any oxygen. We even read that in many textbooks, no oxygen in the early Earth's atmosphere. Now, why do they make this claim of no oxygen in the atmosphere? Well, the answer is easy. They have to. Why? Because we know from observable, repeatable, and measurable experiments that in the presence of oxygen, amino acids necessary for life will not bond together. Oxygen is like a corrosive. It prevents those bonds from occurring. So now, we have to ask this question. Is there any scientific evidence to support this claim of no oxygen in the atmosphere, or is it merely based on a belief in evolution? So now we're going to compare evolution to science, or is it a belief? Well, here's a summary of all our scientific evidence. It comes out of an article called New Evidence on Evolution of Early Atmosphere and Life out of the Bulletin of American Meteorological Society all the way back in 1982. And this is what we knew over 20 years ago. Geologists know from their analysis of the oldest known rocks that the oxygen level of the early atmosphere had to be much higher than previously calculated. Then they go on to state, analysis of these rocks estimated to be more than 3.5 billion years old found oxidized iron in amounts that called for atmospheric oxygen to be at least 110 times greater and perhaps up to 1 billion times greater than otherwise accepted. That statement right there says our textbooks are wrong. And here's another article out of an article called Oxygen in the Atmosphere, an evaluation of the geologic evidence out of one of our geologic periodicals here, March 1982. Again, over 20 years ago, this is what we knew. And this is what they had to say. There is no scientific proof that Earth ever had a non-oxygen atmosphere such as evolutionists require. Earth's oldest rocks contain evidence of being formed in an oxygen atmosphere. You know what this means? This argument is over right there. All the scientific evidence clearly supports this Earth has always had oxygen. If there's oxygen, life cannot start. Isn't that wonderful? But I want to do something here. I'm going to be fair here for just a moment. I want to be fair here for just a moment. It's not one of my attributes, but I'm going to do this anyway. Let's do what our textbooks are doing. Let's ignore the scientific evidence, because that's what our textbooks are doing. So let's take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere. You know what happens when we take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere? We also take away the ozone, 
because it's made out of oxygen O3. And you know what happens when we take that ozone away? We all become instant crispy critters because the ultraviolet rays of the sun will come down and fry all life. So here's what we know based on observable science. If there was oxygen, life can't start. If there was no oxygen, life can't start. Isn't that wonderful now? It leaves only one clear alternative, and that is in the beginning, God created. But let's not go so fast. There's another scenario they're teaching. We saw it on television about a year ago. We see it in some of our textbooks today. Is that life didn't start on the land. We crawled up out of the oceans. Life started in the water is what they're telling us. You know, I love it when people say, we crawled up out of the oceans, that life started in water. Because as soon as they do, I say, let's go get a basic chemistry book. One of those chemistry 101 books. And let's open that book up to a page that talks about hydrolysis. Because you see, hydrolysis is the action of water decomposing molecules, specifically amino acid bonds. You see, water contains an oxygen atom in it. That oxygen atom will insert itself right in the middle of those amino acid bonds and pull them apart. As soon as any amino acids might have formed within the ocean waters, within a matter of weeks, they would have all been destroyed. So here's what we know based on observable science. Life can't start with or without oxygen in the atmosphere, and it can't start in water. There's no place left. That leads the only conclusion now. In the beginning, God created well, let's go to evidence number two then, design and intelligence. Does a design require a designer? Did Miller use intelligent design? Well, Miller determined what gases and quantity and mix to put in his experiment. He determined when to generate the electrical sparks, and they leave one small piece out of the textbooks. He cheated. They just kind of leave that out of the textbooks. See, once Miller got his amino acids, he pulled them out a trap door. Why? Because he knew they couldn't survive in that environment. They just leave all that out of the textbooks. Now, if you're going to run an experiment, and you're going to model it after evolution, this is what you're allowed to do. You're allowed to set up the initial conditions. So Miller was allowed to set up what gases he wanted to put in his experiment. But then once you start that experiment, you must keep your hands off, or you have used intelligent design, and then that supports the creation model and not the evolution model, and that is exactly what Miller, Miller really supported, that it takes intelligence to make these amino acids, not random chance events. Well, let's go to evidence number three then. If you think the water problem was good or the oxygen problem was good, this is the best of them all, amino acids. There are over 2,000 types of amino acids out there, but only 20 are used in life. That means life is very selective. You get one of these wrong amino acids in you, you could be in big trouble. That is, amino acids come in two shapes, just like we have a left hand and a right hand. Well, left and right hand are about the same. Same components, a four fingers and a thumb. But they're not quite the same. Notice what happens when I put one hand behind the other. Notice my thumb and fingers on the opposite side. So even though they have the same components, they're not quite the same. They are what we would call mirror images of each other. Your left and right hand are really mirror images of each other. Now, these amino acids come in the same shape. We call them left-handed amino acids and right-handed amino acids. What's the difference? Well, just like our hands, left and right-handed amino acids are made up of the same components, the same atoms. And also like our left and right hands, these amino acids are mirror images of each other. Now, why is this so important? Well, this becomes important because every single amino acid in your body, and you have trillions of these, is left-handed. You do not have a single right-handed amino acid in your body. Every amino acid and every protein in all life is left-handed. There are no right-handed amino acids used in proteins anywhere in life. Now, why is that so important? Well, that becomes important, again, because our textbooks failed to teach the science. What Miller really ended up with was an even mixture of 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed amino acids. And that is not life. That is a poison to life. They just left that out of the textbooks. But you know, it gets better. Every experiment we've ever done, every experiment we've ever done, always ends up naturally 
with a mixture of left and right-handed amino acids. The natural tendency is always to go to left and right-handed mixtures. Even when we start with all left-handed amino acids, we can do that, plug them out, put them all over here. When we start with all left-handed amino acids, they naturally start reverting back to a mixture. In other words, the tendency is always away from life, never towards life. So how could it get started? The natural tendencies always go away from life. But it gets better than that. When a living organism dies, now, we're made up of 100% left-handed amino acids. When a living organism dies, when we die, we become as dead as we can be, and that's going to be pretty dead. Do you know what happens to our 100% left-handed amino acids? They start reverting back to a mixture of left and right-handedness. What did Miller really simulate? Death, a poison to life. The whole experiment is a known and recognized failure. Produced nothing we needed for life. Now the question is, why do they continue to put known wrong information in textbooks? Well, to illustrate why they do this, I'm going to need to create maybe just a little bit of anxiety in you out there. Incidentally, creating anxiety in other people is my spiritual gift. And here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you a math problem. That's enough for some of you right there. Now, I'm going to give you this math problem. Now, before you try and come up with an answer, before you try and come up with an answer to this math problem, I want to qualify with the kind of answer you can give. So here's your math problem. How much is 3 plus 1? And you cannot use the number four because I don't like the way it looks. It's a little bit too religious for me. Now, I want your answer as an exact number. I won't even accept 3.9999. I don't want any fingers in the air. I don't want any toes in the air. I don't want it spelled out. I don't want any Roman numerals. If you're multilingual, I want your answer in English. I don't want any formulas like 10 minus 6 or 2 squared. If you're one of those computer people, I want your answer in base 10. So how much is 3 plus 1? And some people might say 7, and my answer to that is, that's correct. Somebody might say 13, and that is correct also. And somebody might even say 20, and that is correct too. Now wait a minute. How can all these different answers, 7, or 13, or 20, be correct to a simple little problem like 3 plus 1? Well, here's the solution. If you rule the truth out, if you cannot accept the truth, then you must accept anything in its place. And folks, that is what evolution is. They have ruled out the truth of a creator God and must accept anything in its place, even to the point today of teaching our youth that 3 plus 1 equals 7, because that's exactly the kind of teaching they're doing when they teach the Miller experiment is a success when it is known not to be. What kind of scientist are we going to turn out? How are youth going to understand anything about science? They're going to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And that is exactly what we see until we get back to teaching real science in the science classrooms. Now, what have the scientists had to say about this Miller experiment? Here's Freeman Dyson in his book, Origins of Life, 1999. Now, he's a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and he makes this statement. Since Miller's beguiling picture of a pond full of dissolved amino acids under a reducing atmosphere, that's one with no oxygen, has been discredited. And then he says, a new beguiling picture has come to take its place. The new picture has life originating in a hot, deep, dark hole in the ocean floor. Notice he calls that a beguiling picture because he noticed, noticed that life can't start in water also. It can't start with or without oxygen, and it can't start in water. That is what the scientists know. Then here's this gentleman, William Bonner, organic chemist, Stanford University. He is one of the world's leading homochiral researchers. Homochiral, homo meaning same, chiral, the Greek word for handedness. Same handedness, all left-handed amino acids. And here is his conclusion for why life only has only left-handed amino acids. And he says, terrestrial explanations are impotent and non-viable. He doesn't have a clue. 
But notice his first two words, terrestrial explanations. Where do you think he thinks we came from? Outer space. I'd like to address that just a moment, this whole concept of aliens. Because we've been Hollywoodized today. We've been overly Hollywood, Hollywoodized today. Now, if we can't get 100% left-handed amino acids on this planet, how can it happen anywhere else? As far as we know, the laws of science work equally well everywhere in this universe. To say there's 100% left-handed amino acids out there is not founded anywhere in science. It is a faith statement, and we need to keep science to the science classrooms. Oh, but Mike, Mike, we find these meteorites out there, and they come down and strike this earth, and we find amino acids on these meteorites. Yes, we do. But when you read the journals, what they don't tell you is that in every single case on these meteorites, it ended up being a mixture of left and right-handed amino acids. They just leave that information out from the public. That's called deception by omission. Now, again, we've been Hollywoodized. Many people today can't even tell the difference between science and science fiction because they're following Hollywood so much and they're reading too much and believing all that's in our textbooks. They can't tell the difference. For example, we watch these, these TV shows, Star Trek, and we watch Captain Kirk and his other people communicating halfway across the universe in just one hour. Folks, that is Hollywood. It's science fiction. Because you know radio waves do not travel any faster than the speed of light. So consider this. The nearest star to us, other than the sun, is about four light years away. That's about 24 trillion miles. Now, if there was a planet there, and there is none, and they had intelligent life there, and they decided to travel to our planet, and once they got here, they wanted to communicate back to the home planet, get a response back, folks, that would take eight years. That's a pretty long-running episode of Star Trek now. That's just to the nearest star. The nearest galaxy to us is about 2 million light years away. It would take 2 million years to get here and 2 million years to get your radio transmission back to your home planet. By the time the transmission got back to your home planet, everybody's dead. You see, this whole concept of intelligent life in outer space is not founded anywhere in science. It is strictly a faith-based religion, not science. Anybody remember seeing a picture like this? This picture of the cell? Remember that day that teacher handed out that picture of the cell and had all these components inside the cell and all these blank lines pointing to these components and you had to fill in all these blank lines and you couldn't even spell the words? But I'm not going to talk about that cell here. I mean, you're probably saying amen to that one. But I want to point out one thing about that cell. One cell, and you have about 60 trillion of these in your body, just one cell is more complex than any computer we've ever built. Now, does anybody really believe these computers got here by random chance processes over long periods of time? Now, they might act like it at times, but that's not how they got here. So then is it logical to believe a cell could happen by random chance processes over long periods of time when it is many more times complex than our computers? Now, here's another, something else. Anybody ever ridden in one of those jumbo jets, a Boeing 747? Some of you may have. And I want to give you some confidence in that airplane right now. Did you know that Boeing 747 is made up of four and a half million non-flying parts? Not a single part of that plane flies by itself. So what makes it fly? Well, to understand that, let's go to the cell. You know, a cell is not made up of four and a half million parts. It is made up of billions of non-living parts. So what makes the cell alive then? Well, one of the same things that makes that airplane fly. It's called design and organization. So the next time you get on that Boeing 747, don't just be asking, are all four and a half million pieces there? You better be asking, are they all in the right order? It makes a big difference. Now, I want to turn to another section in this talk, mathematics, probability. And what we want to do in this probability is a little coin flipping. When we flip a coin, we have two possible outcomes, heads and tails. And now we relate that to the amino acid situation, because we have two possible shapes of amino acids, left-handed and right-handed. And what we want to do is flip this coin and get heads every single time. 
Now, the probability of getting heads every single time will be the same probability of getting only left-handed amino acids bonded together. So let's go through this. How many times must we flip a coin probability-wise to get one head? And the answer is twice. Flip that coin twice, you'll get at least one occurrence somewhere in there of one head. Do it off enough, again, that will be your average. Now, how many times must we flip a coin probability-wise to get two heads in a row? And the answer is four. Flip that coin four times, somewhere in there you get at least one occurrence of two heads in a row. Again, do that often enough, that will be your average. Now, how many times must we flip a coin probability-wise to get three heads in a row? And the answer is eight. You see our probability sequence now. It goes like this, two to the first power, two to the second power, two to the third power. You flip that coin eight times, somewhere in there you're going to get three heads in a row. Again, do it enough, enough, often enough, that will be your average. Now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Why? Because an average size protein has over 300 left-handed amino acids in it. So let's skip ahead to eight. How many times must we flip a coin probability-wise to get eight heads in a row? And the answer to that is 256. Two to the eighth power is 256 times. You flip that coin 256 times, somewhere in there you're going to get eight heads in a row. So you could do that right here now. You could flip that coin 256 times, and somewhere in there you're going to get eight heads in a row. If it doesn't happen in your first sequence of 256, try it again and again and again. Pretty soon that'll be your average, and you'll have a very big thumb. Now I'm going to skip ahead one more time. Now this next one I like to assign as your homework assignment. This will be your homework assignment. There's only one rule to this homework assignment. And that is, don't call me until you're finished. What I want you to do is flip that coin and get 100 heads in a row. So you're flipping that coin, you got 62 heads in a row, 63 heads in a row, 64 heads in a row, and then you flip a tails, you've got to start all over again. Same thing for building a biological protein out of amino acids. We got 62 left-handed amino acids bonded together, then 63, then 64, then a right-handed amino acid gets in there. That whole protein is now useless for life because right-handed amino acids cause that protein to fold the wrong way. And proteins do what they do based on the way they fold. So all it takes is one wrong amino acid that can cause devastating diseases. You know, it's only one amino acid change that causes sickle cell anemia. You know, more people die of sickle cell anemia than they do malaria. So how many times do we have to flip this coin to get 100 heads in a row? And again, this is your homework assignment. Don't call me until you're finished. In order to achieve this, you're going to flip that coin 2 to the 100th power, which equates to about 10 to the 30th power, 1 followed by 30 zeros. Now, let me give you an idea how fast you're going to have to flip. You're going to have to flip that coin about 31 million times times a second for over one quadrillion years. I am still waiting for my first call here for the homework assignment. Now let me put this in perspective. What we're saying is we'd have to be doing 31 million chemical reactions a second in that mythical primordial soup for over a quadrillion years just to come up with one small protein which is not even close to life yet. Now, what is the maximum age of this universe based on the evolutionist theories? About 20 billion years. Folks, we're out to a quadrillion years just to get a small protein. See, there's not enough time in the whole history of the universe to get a protein, let alone a living cell. But I'm going to be fair here one more time. One more time, we'll be fair. Let's suppose a miracle happened. A miracle happened and we got a protein. What good is it? See, a protein has no instructions to replicate itself because that requires DNA, which is even more complex. And what happens if there's oxygen out there? It's pulled apart. What happens if there's no oxygen? It's fried. And what happens if it's in water? It's decomposed. You see, even if the miracle could occur, it can't last. So let's turn to some more probability here. There's a law of probability 10 to the 50th power. Really, it's 10 to the minus 50th power, because in probabilities, we work in small numbers. But most people don't like to work in fractions, so I'm going to turn it around here and just work with large numbers. It'll be the same situation here. The law of probability basically says this. If the chances of an event to occur are greater than this number, 
that event will never happen. Notice it said the word never. That's why we have the law of probability. It will not happen on the first try. It will not happen on the second try or the third try. It will never happen. That's why we call it the law of probability. Anything beyond 10 to the 50th power will never happen. Now, that's a big number. That's a big number. But there are bigger numbers than that. In the dictionary, there's a number called Google. Now, what's a Google? Well, that's one followed by a hundred zeros. Some dictionaries even have bigger numbers than that. There's a number called Googleplex. Now, what's a Googleplex? That's a Google raised to the Google power. It's a big number. Now, I want to prove something here. We've had enough math here. We can prove something. I want to prove this. We can prove that every one of us started off as a mathematician. Every one of us started off as a mathematician. Think of this now. When we were just knee high, just knee high, lying down in that crib looking up, what were we saying? Google, Google, there's your proof. Well, back to probability, back to probability. Now, what do the mathematicians calculate is the probability of one protein occurring by random chance? We're still not even at life, but one protein, they calculate that probability is 10 to the 191st power. It will never happen. But then, what do the mathematicians calculate is the probability of one cell, now we're finally at life, occurring by random chance? That is 10 to the 40,000th power. It will never happen ever happen. Not in a trillion years, not even in a quadrillion years. What we have seen here is this. Romans 1, 19 and 20. God has given us all the evidence we need, and we have no excuse for not believing. Only God could do this. To get beyond all these laws of probability, to get all left-handed amino acids, only God could do that. He gave us all the evidence. Now, I'm not saying you can't believe in evolution. You can continue to believe in evolution, but you're not doing so because of science. You're doing so because you have faith in evolution. Now, here's some probability. Francis Crick. Now, Francis Crick is one of the co-discoverers of DNA. This is what he wrote back in 1981 about probabilities and amino acids. If a particular amino acid sequence was selected by chance, how rare an event would this be? And he says... The great majority of sequences can never have been synthesized at all at any time. That is a statement from one of your leading evolutionists. It can never happen. Here's another gentleman, Robert Gaines, PhD. He's a research scientist with experience in the field of cryophysics and information systems. And this is what he writes in his book, Origins and Destiny, back in 1986. The likelihood of life having occurred through a chemical accident is for all intents and purposes zero. These people understand mathematics. They understand probabilities, and they know full well it will never happen. Doesn't mean you can't believe in evolution, but you're not doing it because of science. You're doing it because you have faith in evolution. Evolution cannot be scientifically supported. Now let's go to amino acids. A typical amino acid is made up of about 20 atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now, in order to get this amino acid, here's what happened. Now, we're not even to a protein yet. Just to get the right amino acid, first of all, we have to get all the right atoms. Got to have the right atoms. Then the atoms must be arranged in the right order. And then we have to make sure this amino acid is a left-handed amino acid. All those things have to happen. So now let's take a look at, can computers do this? How fast are our computers? Well, here's a statement all the way back in 1998 out of Science Journal. And it says this about computers and proteins. Scientists have been attempting to be able to determine a protein's native conformation, or how it folds, by examining the amino acid sequence. Despite years of study, the ability to do this using even the fastest computers is beyond our reach. In other words, the fastest computers in the world cannot determine how a protein got together, because they have to get the right atoms, arrange in the right order, and make sure it's left-handed. And then they go on to say this. Using a super fast computer, 10 to the 15th computations a second, it would take 10 to the 80th seconds, which exceed the age of the universe by a factor of 60 orders of magnitude. This fact alone may give you a better perspective on the mind of God. Now, there's some big numbers in there. 10 to the 15th computations a second. 
Now, we've got computers on our desktop, Pentium 1000s, Pentium 2000s, Pentium 3000s, and we're going beyond that pretty soon. Now, what does a Pentium 1000 mean? Well, the 1000, we're talking about 1000 megahertz, or 1 billion instructions per second. That is fast. But that's nothing compared to this computer. 10 to the 15th computations a second is a quadrillion computations a second. It would take that computer over a trillion years to build one protein from scratch. You see, there's not enough time in the whole history of the universe. It gets better. Now, here's another study just done. Now, in this study, using some of the fastest computers in the world, what they started with was all the right atoms, and all the atoms were arranged in the right order for all the amino acids. And all this computer has to do now is fold this protein the right way. So they start with all the right atoms, all the right arrangement. All they have to do, all this computer has to do is fold this protein. So in Los Alamos, New Mexico, October 14, 2002, researchers at Los Alamos Natural Laboratory in the University of California, San Diego, have created the first computer simulation of full system protein folding thermodynamics at the atomic level. Now again, what they're saying here is all they have to do is fold this protein. They modeled the folding of a simple protein of 18,000 atoms on their computers. Again, they were given all the right atoms, all the right arrangement. Just fold this. How long did it take these computers to do this? It took six months on 82 parallel processors, which amounts to 34 years of CPU time. Just to fold the thing, not pick the atoms. Is there anything faster than this? Yes, there is. The cell folds this particular protein in about 10 microseconds, or millionths of a second, which is 100 trillion times as fast as our fastest computers. Now, if we think we have a lot of intelligence with our computers, we don't stack up against the cell, folks. The cell, in this case, is 100 trillion times faster than anything we can build. So what is the fastest computer in the world? Not anything we've made. It's the cell, folks. Well, let's go to the primordial soup now. What's the possibility that life arose when we pulled non-living chemicals? We can examine that in three different areas of science. We can look at chemistry, we can look at biology, and we can look at physics. Now, it's not so bad. Some of this is going to be review. We've already covered some of this. For example, chemistry. We've already looked at that, something called hydrolysis. That is the action of water decomposing molecules. Now, water is necessary for life, but it is detrimental to the origin of life. We hear things like this, water on the moon, water on Mars, water on Jupiter's moons. Then the next sentence, they start talking about life up there. Folks, if there's water up there, there won't be any life because life can't start in water. Then there's biology. We've already talked about that. Every amino acid and every protein and all life is left-handed. There are no right-handed amino acids used in proteins anywhere in life. And it gets better than that. We all have something that is called DNA. And our DNA is made up of sugars and phosphates and bases. And those sugars in our DNA can come in two shapes, left-handed sugars and right-handed sugars. But all the sugars in our DNA are right-handed. See, it's not just one probability problem. There are multiple probability problems out here. But then we can turn to physics. Physics should be the easiest of all the sciences because we practice that every day of our lives. Physics is a lot of the study of what? Motion and movement. We're up there moving around. We're doing our physics. And what we want to talk about here is the second law of thermodynamics because it's very important here. It's a very important and well-established law. It's so important because it's been stated that anything that contradicts the second law of thermodynamics cannot happen. So let's take a look at our definition. Definition goes like this. Energy goes from a state of usable energy to a state of less usable energy for doing work in an isolated system. Again, what that is saying is over time, everything's losing its available energy for doing work. Everything's running downhill over time. Just like what happens to us at the end of the day, we've lost our available energy for doing anything else. Now, the correlation is complexity to less complexity, or decay. Now, what I want to do is take us through a discussion between a creationist and an evolutionist and show you how this argument should end up. And let me start here. I'll put my creation hat on. I'll make this statement. Evolution 
contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. Now, why would I make that statement as a creationist? Well, easy. The second law says everything's losing complexity. Everything's losing its available energy if you're doing work. But the evolution model, on the other hand, says everything's gaining complexity information. That goes completely against the second law. Therefore, evolution contradicts the second law. Looks pretty good right now. But now let me put my evolution hat on. Now I'm going to make this statement. Mike, you don't understand the second law of thermodynamics. Because, you see, the second law talks about isolated systems, and we live in an open system. So we have this open, isolated system discussion now. And what's the difference? Well, an open system is any system where we can add matter energy into the system or take matter and energy out of the system. Examples, the Earth is an open system. We can, the sun adds energy onto the Earth. This room we're in is an open system. Things come in, things go out. Our bodies are open systems. We add energy to our body every time we're in the sun or eat something. Every time we do some form of work, we burn off that energy. Even a cup of coffee is an open system. Almost everything in this universe is an open system. But what's an isolated system? That is a system where no matter nor energy can get in or out. It is totally isolated. The only theoretical isolated system we know of is the universe itself. Scientifically, we know of nothing outside the universe can get in or out. Now, remember the definition of the second law talked about isolated systems. And now we have this counter-argument that since we live in an open system, things can grow and become more complex because we can add energy into it. And the examples we see in our textbooks usually go like this. The example of the growth of an animal embryo into a full adult animal. Isn't that an example of becoming more complex in order over time? Sure it is, we're told. We live in an open system. We can add energy onto it, allowing it to grow and become more complex. Therefore, evolution does not contradict the second law. It works right there with it in an open system. Then we have a seed growing to a full tree. Isn't that an example of becoming more complex and ordered? Sure it is, we're told. We live in an open system. We can add energy onto that seed, allowing it to grow and become more complex. Therefore, evolution does not contradict the second law. It works right there with it in an open system. Now, it doesn't look so good. Looks like evolution passes the test. But now, to coin somebody else's words, let's look at the rest of the story, those parts that are not taught in our textbooks. You see, for anything... To become more complex and gain in information, there are four necessary conditions. Number one, we must have an open system. Everybody agrees with that. That's even in the textbooks. Number two, we must have an available source of energy. Everybody agrees with that. That's also in the textbooks. But it's these next two that are commonly left out of the textbooks to protect evolution. Number three, we must have a mechanism that can capture and store that raw energy. See, if you can't capture it, you can't use it. You can have all the energy input you want into the system, but if you can't capture it, all you're going to get is more decay. Where did that capture mechanism come from? There is no scientific explanation for that. Let me give you an analogy. I like to ask this question. How many computer people do I have out there? And sometimes I don't get a lot of hands. And probably because I scare people off with the math question and the, and the homework assignment. And so I rephrase this statement. It goes like this. How many of you have turned a computer on? And then I get a lot of hands. Then I like to tell everybody, you just qualified to be a computer engineer. Why? Because you know what we do at Microsoft at times when that computer doesn't work right? We turn it off and we turn it on and sometimes it works again. So everybody qualifies as a computer engineer here tonight. So here's what I want you to do. Go home, open up your computer, Take out your floppy disk drive, take out your hard drive, take all your memory chips out. Then sit down at the keyboard and start typing. And tell me how long you'll continue to type before you find out nothing is happening. And why is nothing happening? Because there's no mechanism in that computer now to capture the input from the keyboard. If you can't capture it, you can't use it. Number four, we also must have a mechanism that can take that captured raw energy and convert it into usable energy for doing work and then put it to work. Where did that mechanism come from? Again, there's no scientific explanation. We have something in our body we talk about metabolism. Metabolism. When we eat foodstuffs, we have that process in our body that breaks those chemicals, that foodstuff, down to its basic chemicals. And at some point, there's a mechanism in our body that takes those basic raw chemicals and converts them 
into usable energy and then puts them to work. Where did that mechanism in our body come from? There is no scientific explanation. We can understand how some of the process works, but nobody can explain the origin of it. The same for the plant kingdom. We have something called photosynthesis. We can open a biology textbook and learn about, a lot about how photosynthesis works, but nobody can explain how it originated. You see the problem. The origin of life is a major problem for evolution. Now I want to go back and answer some of those counter-arguments from the evolutionist. How about the open, isolated system argument? Is that a valid argument? No, it is not. Because see, the second law also applies to open systems. Now I'm a perfect example of that. I'm a perfect example of that. See, 25 years ago, I could high jump way over my head. 25 years ago, I could run 100 meters well under 11 seconds. Now, I've been living in an open system these last 25 years, constantly adding energy to my body, and guess what happened to me? I got worse. You know what I run 100 meters now? I don't even use a stopwatch. I'm just thankful to finish the race. You see, the scientists who work in this field know full well that the second law also applies to open systems. Here's a gentleman, Dr. John Ross. He's a Harvard scientist and an evolutionist. And he wrote this in Chemical Engineering News back in 1980, and he works in this field. This is what he has to say. There are no known violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Ordinarily, the second law is stated for isolated systems, but the second law applies equally well to open systems. See, the scientists who work in this field know how heat energy works. Now, what about those other counter-arguments? The animal embryo growing into a full adult animal and the seed growing into a full tree. Are those good arguments for the evolution model? No, they're not. They show a misunderstanding of information and the second law of thermodynamics and how they apply to the origin of life. See, in both those cases, that animal embryo and the seed already contain all the information in them telling them what to do and how to do it. It's called DNA. See, the real question is, where did that immense amount of information come from for that DNA? And there's no explanation for that. That's why it gets left out of the textbooks. If it can't be explained, we'll just won't talk about it. That's called deception by omission. We need to keep all the scientific evidence in the books. Well, let's do a quick review and move on now. Four things that we've seen that are detrimental to the origin of life. Number one, oxygen in the atmosphere says life can't start. Also, if there was no oxygen, it can't start. The second law of thermodynamics prohibits the origin of life by natural processes for two reasons. One, there's not enough time in the whole history of the universe to even get a protein, let alone a living cell. And secondly, the more time we have, the more decay we will have because we must have all four mechanisms. Third, water is detrimental to the origin of life. Hydrolysis. And fourth, amino acids. Every amino acid and every protein in all life is left-handed. We also saw all the sugars in our DNA are right-handed. Every one of these points to Romans 1, 19 and 20. God has given us all the evidence, and we have no excuse for not believing. Now let's go to the last piece, information and complexity. Charles Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. Now in his book, The Origin of Species, guess what he never really talked about? The origin of species. He didn't have a clue how life originated, so he just skipped over that. Well, here we are about 150 years later, and we still don't have a clue how life started by natural processes. Now what I want to do is take the entire model of evolution and put it into a formula, because I like formulas. And if you were to do that, that formula would look like this. M plus E plus T, or matter plus energy plus time, somehow equals complex codes or life. That is all the evolution model requires, matter, energy, and time. Now I want to do the same thing for the creation model, put it into a very similar type formula, and it would look like this. Matter plus energy plus time plus outside intelligence equals complex codes or life. Now, which one or ones of these formulas have we ever observed creating complex codes? Well, we can do a couple of simple examples here. Let's suppose we were to take this building completely apart into its basic components. That would be the matter. Then we let the sun shine out for the energy. Then we give you millions of years of time. What are you going to get? Rubble, decay. 
That's the evolution model. But if we add outside intelligence, we can get a building. That is the creation model. Well, let's do the same thing with a computer. Let's take a computer completely apart into its basic components, because I know some of you would like to do that sometimes with a blunt instrument. So the next time you get that urge, just think, you're about ready to do a scientific experiment now. So let's take that computer completely apart into its basic components. That's the matter. We let the sun shine on it for all the energy, and then we give you millions and billions of years, what are you going to get? Rubble, decay. Again, that's the evolution formula. But if we had outside intelligence, we can get a computer. Which model is that? The creation model. You know, we've never, ever observed random chance processes creating complex codes with information. In it is always the creation formula, never the evolution model. And that means, in this case, that the creation model is the more scientific model because that's the only one we ever observe. And science is based on observation. Here's the gentleman, Dr. Werner Gitt, wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information in 1997. Now, he is the director of the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. He's pretty high up there. He's also considered to be one of the top information scientists in the world. And this is what he has to say. Since the findings of James D. Watson and Francis H. C. Crick, the two co-discoverers of DNA, it was increasingly realized by contemporary researchers that the information residing in the cells is of crucial importance for the existence of life. Now, what he's saying there is life requires information. Now you have the answer to the New Age people that say, oh, we're all the same stuff. No, we're not. We're different from rocks. We have information. Rocks don't. And then he goes on to say this. Anybody who wants to make meaningful statements about the origin of life would be forced to explain how the information originated. All evolutionary views are fundamentally unable to answer this crucial question. The crucial question is, where did information come from? Evolution cannot answer this. So let's go back to that Boeing 747. I want to bring it back one more time here. What happens when we add energy to meaningless chemicals, bits, and parts? Suppose I were to say, here's that Boeing 747 out there, all four and a half million pieces in a pile. Would anybody here get on it and fly it? No, it's a silly idea. Well, how about if we did this? Put all four and a half million pieces there, then let the sun shine on it for energy for millions of years. Now we get on it and fly it. No, it's still a silly idea, but you know, that is matter, energy, and time, and you don't trust it. That's called the evolution model. But let's do the same thing with a cell. Let's take all the atoms we need for a cell, fill up the entire Atlantic Ocean with all that. That is now our primordial soup. All the atoms we need for a cell. And let the sun shine on it for millions and billions of years. What's going to happen? Nothing but decay. Why? Because even in that scenario, we only have two mechanisms. We still don't have a mechanism that can capture the raw energy, and we have no mechanism that can convert raw energy into usable energy. So all we will get is decay. Even when we have all the right ingredients, it still doesn't work. Here's another gentleman, Dr. Klostos, writes, in his article, The Origin of Life, More Questions Than Answers. Now, Dr. Doss is an evolutionist, and he's a biochemist. And he's worked in this field for many, many years. And this is what he has to say about the origin of life. More than 30 years of experimentation on the origin of life in the fields of chemical and molecular evolution have led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth rather than to its solution. And then he concludes with, at present, all discussions on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or a confession of ignorance. You won't see that quote in any textbooks. Now, this next gentleman, this next gentleman takes everything we've just talked about and puts it into nice, easy to understand words. Don't you like people who can do that? Take all this complicated matter and puts it into something every one of us can understand. And he says this. The chances that life just occurred are about as unlikely as a typhoon blowing through a junkyard and constructing a Boeing 747. That is easy to understand. Now I want to read one more quote to you. One more quote. And this quote comes from Dr. Paul Davies. He is a physicist and a leading evolutionist. And he writes this in the book called The Fifth Miracle of Search for the Origin and Meaning of Life. And he says this about the origin of life. Many investigators feel uneasy about stating in public 
that the origin of life is a mystery. Even though behind closed doors they freely admit they are baffled. Now wait a minute there. What is he saying? He's saying even many of the evolutionists fully understand they don't have a clue, but they don't want the public to know that. Why don't they want the public to know that? Well, he goes on to state why, and he says this. They worry that a frank admission of ignorance will undermine funding. What did he just say there? What's driving a lot of this evolution? Not education, not science, but making sure they get their government grants. Now, I'm not saying this about all evolutionists, but the model itself is being driven by this. Not by science, not by education, but making sure we won't tell the public what we don't know, so we continue to get our monies to do our projects. But you know, there are many, many people out there that don't believe that. There are many, many people out there that believe in a six-day creation. And there's thousands of PhD scientists today that believe in a six-day creation about 6,000 years ago. We've got people in geology, physics, nuclear physics, astronomy, biochemistry, genetics, neurosurgeons. We've got people from every area of science that believe in a six-day creation. Why do they believe that? Two reasons. One, that is what the Bible teaches. And secondly, they can support it scientifically. Then we go all the way down to the bottom of this. We have people like Dr. Charles Taylor, Robert Cole, Stephen Boyd, all Hebrew scholars. They all believe in a six-day creation about 6,000 years ago. Why? Because that is exactly what the Hebrew in the, in the Bible teaches. Now, one more thing on education. This statement in education comes in two parts. I want you to think about it, specifically with all the things we've said here. And it goes like this. If I tell you only part of the evidence and you believe it, you have not been taught, you have been indoctrinated. Think about what we just went through here. Are we being taught or are we being indoctrinated in our public schools today? Think about, again, the Miller experiment. Deception by omission. Second law of thermodynamics, deception by omission. They are leaving out the critical parts of science that refute evolution to protect it. That is called indoctrination. That's what we're doing in this country. We're in full-scale indoctrination to protect a religion called evolution. And this is what we should be doing. If I tell you all the evidence and you make a decision, then you have been taught. I'm not standing here saying, let's teach religion or creation in the science classroom. What I am saying, and what we are legally allowed to do in this country, is teach all the scientific information, allow our students to do critical thinking, and come to their own conclusion. But that is not being allowed in this country. There are organizations in this country fighting as hard as they can to keep the real science out of the textbooks. So let's bring it to a conclusion now. The origin of life by natural processes and evolution is not scientifically possible by any mechanism we know of. We've got to get all left-handed amino acids. That hasn't been done. There's not enough time in the whole history of the universe to even get a protein, let alone a living cell. And life is complex. No one can describe how information arose by natural processes. But yet, we're all looking at the same evidence, aren't we? How do we come to different conclusions? Easy. See, some people choose to start with God's word as their worldview. And other people choose to start with man's word as their worldview. So we're looking at it from different glasses. But also keep in mind, there are many, many scientists that do believe in a six-day creation. And that list is growing every year. But also keep in mind, neither evolution or creation can be proven scientifically. Both must ultimately be accepted by faith. And finally, it's your choice what to believe. I never stand here saying, this is what you must believe. That is not my obligation here. I am simply here to deliver a message. Your job is to decide which one you want to believe. Your job is to go out and look at all the evidence and come to your own conclusion. But there are only two conclusions you can come to. Only two. One is this. You can put your entire trust and hope into Jesus Christ. God, who came down to this planet as a man, suffered and died on a cross, shed his blood for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and then was raised from the dead to offer each and every one of us hope if we accept God's one and only solution, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the Bible also teaches that his grace and mercy can cover anything we have done. 
That is the God we're talking about. That is one conclusion. Your other conclusion is this. You can put your entire trust and hope into a man by the name of Charles Darwin, who lived, died, and stayed dead. <laughs>